Hi. So in this lecture, I'd like to cover um, a kind of hodgepodge of scaling laws for different phenomena. Okay, now remember, the scaling law is how the magnitude of the phenomenon scales as the size of the particle or affected entity scales in size. All right, so we're not looking for a, uh, a perfect description here. What we're looking for instead is kind of a rule of thumb or a general idea about um, how to link macroscale size systems to nanoscale size systems. Okay, so first let's talk a little bit about fluids at the nanoscale and microscale. So microfluidics is a, um, a pretty exciting field right now, and it's the study and behavior and of behavior and control of fluids at the submillimeter level. Now these have a lot of applications in um, uh, today's technologies. So in today's technologies, there's these lab on a chip kind of applications where they're doing, for example, blood analysis, among other things. Um, could also be water quality analysis. And then you don't need to have a large volume of your fluid in order to do the test, which is, you know, the real advantage of this for blood tests. Another application of um, microfluidics is inkjet printing, which is something that, you know, you might have a little experience with. So at the micro sub small scale, um, the fluid flow is laminar and not turbulent in general. Now remember, laminar flow is nice straight controlled lines type of flow. And turbulent flow has a lot of eddies and the uh, lines of motion for the fluid kind of go all over the place. Okay? <clears throat> so let's talk about fluid flow through a pipe, which is important for the lab on the chip applications, among other things. So these microfluidics chips, they use these little tiny pipes like you saw in the figure to deliver fluid from one location to another. And of course, this is laminar flow, not turbulent flow. So a laminar flow of fluid through a pipe can be well described by the following equation. Delta P is equal to 8 mu L Q over pi R to the fourth. So defining the variables, here delta P is the pressure difference um, between two points that are a distance L apart in your pipe. R is the radius of that pipe. Q is the volumetric flow rate. So the units of Q are meters cubed per second. So it's about a volume that flows past some sort of reference point per unit time, okay? Mu is the dynamic viscosity of the fluid, which is how resistive, how resistant the fluid is to flow. You can kind of think of it like friction, but for fluids, okay? And of course, this is the dynamic viscosity, and the units of that are Pascal seconds. Okay, so if you think about this equation, um, it kind of makes sense, right? Uh, you have a flow rate, Q. That's what we're really interested in for a lot of applications. Okay, so Q is the flow rate. So what governs that flow rate? And then the other equation that we're interested in, backing out from this equation, is maybe the pressure gradient through a length of pipe. So let's talk about these two different um, applications of the same equation. So here, if we solve for Q, Q is equal to delta P pi R to the fourth over 8 mu L, okay? So if we ignore the pressure and we assume that mu is a material property, uh, viscosity is fixed for different types of, uh, of fluids, for example, um, then let's think about R and L, which are the things that would scale here. Now, for fluid flow, most of the pipes that we're looking at are a lot longer than they are wide. And of course, the controlling figure here, the controlling parameter, is going to be the radius of the pipe. That's going to be a lot more important for fluid flow than the length. And so we're going to say that the scaling law for the volumetric flow rate Q is going to be that radius, R to the fourth. And so that means that our, our fluid flow rate Q scales as the characteristic dimension to the fourth power. And it makes total sense that the fluid flow through a pipe would be a lot, lot faster for a fatter pipe than for a tiny pipe. That makes sense to me. Okay, now... Let's look at the other aspect of it, which is the pressure gradient through a length of pipe. If we solve for um, delta P, again, looking at delta P and then extracting delta P over L, one step that we can use is we can consider 
the volumetric flow rate written in other terms. Now you can also write the volumetric flow rate as V, the velocity of the fluid in the pipe, times the pipe's area, pi r squared. If you need to, take just a second and pause it and think about that. But remember, dimensionally, the vo volumetric flow rate is meters cubed per second, or the volume that's flowing past in a pipe per unit time. Okay? So if we plug V times pi r squared into our equation now for delta P, then we end up with um, 8 mu L V pi r squared over pi r to the fourth. Okay? Simplifying, the r's can cancel out here. So simplifying that equation, we get 8 mu L V over r squared. Now solving for the pressure gradient through a length of pipe, delta P over L, we can see here that it's proportional to 1 over r squared, right? And so that means that it's going to be proportional to, in general, 1 over the characteristic dimension squared, okay? So let's look at um, an example problem for this particular application, the delta P over L. A crude oil pipe's radius is reduced by 5%. What's the corresponding percentage change in the pressure drop per unit length? Okay, so we're looking here at the scaling all for delta P over L. So that delta P over L is proportional to 1 over D squared. So let's say that you reduce it by 5%. So that means that your radius, say for example, might be 0.95 times whatever your original radius was. Okay. So our scaling laws, the ratio of those uh, scaling laws would be 1 over 0.95 R squared divided by 1 over R squared, right? So that gives us 1 over 0.95 squared, which gives us 1.11. So what that means is that you would see an 11% increase in your pressure change per unit length if you shrunk your pipe size, your pipe radius, by 5%. Okay, let's talk about some other things for fluid flow. So one thing that um, people are often interested in is the terminal velocity of a particle, a nano-sized particle, flowing, falling through a fluid, okay? Now, what are some of the principles that govern that? Well, that nano-sized particle falling through the fluid experiences the force of gravity, it also experiences a buoyant force, and then it experiences um, a uh, resistive force from viscosity. So let's talk about each of these equations in turn. Um, Archimedes' principle governs the buoyant force. Specifically, it says that the buoyant force on an object um, immersed in a fluid is equal to the weight of the fluid which is displaced by that object. So in other words, to calculate that, you're going to take the density of your fluid and multiply it times the volume of your object and then times the acceleration due to gravity, g. And that'll give you the weight of the fluid displaced by the object. Now drag or viscosity is another thing that you need to consider when you're considering the terminal velocity of a particle falling through a fluid. And um, for laminar flow, which is what we've got for most tiny little systems, that's what we consider. The drag force is minus BV, okay, where B is the coefficient that characterizes how much drag you have, and V is the velocity of the particle. So if the object is a sphere, lots of nanoparticles can be modeled as spheres quite well, for example, then B can be written as 6 pi mu r, okay, where here mu is the viscosity and r is the radius of the particle. So let's say that we have this spherical nanoparticle flowing, falling through a fluid. If you draw your free body diagram, you've got your resistive force due to the viscosity pointing upward, you've got your buoyant force pointing upward, and you've got gravity pointing downward. Okay, if we take down as positive, then let's solve for what the net force on that particle is. Now the net force at terminal velocity is going to be zero because of course terminal velocity is when the particle is not accelerating anymore. And then we can solve for what the terminal velocity is from this force equation. So here we have mg minus b times the terminal velocity v sub t minus rho g v and that's equal to zero at terminal velocity. So plugging in for various things, remember that we said the mass was the density times the volume, okay? So mg would be the density of your solid material times the volume of your particle times g, and remember here we're talking about a sphere, so the volume is 4 thirds pi r cubed, okay? So that gives us our first term, mg is equal to rho sub s, 4 thirds pi r cubed g.
Now our second term was minus b v sub t, where v sub t was the terminal velocity and b was the coefficient for drag. Now we can write that drag coefficient as 6 pi mu r, right? And then multiply that times our terminal velocity. So that gives us our second term. And then finally we have rho fluid g v. Yet again, v is 4 thirds pi r cubed because it's a sphere. And so our third term is rho fluid times g 4 thirds pi r cubed. So we're going to, to take the vector sum of all those things, right? Um, sum them up, set them equal to zero, and solve for our terminal velocity. When we do that, we get our terminal velocity is equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed g times the density of the solid minus the density of the fluid divided by 6 pi mu r, all right? So simplifying, canceling out some r's that we don't care about in the pi's and all that kind of stuff, and simplifying the coefficients, we get 2 ninths g r squared rho solid minus rho fluid divided by mu. So if you think about it, your densities, those are material properties that don't change as you change the scale of your particle. For the most part, you can assume that's true. Your viscosity isn't going to change, right? G doesn't change. And so your terminal velocity will then scale as r squared, or the radius of your particle, or its characteristic dimension squared. So the terminal velocity, and of course the time to reach that velocity, are going to scale as d squared. Okay, so moving on. Let's talk about optics a little bit. So you might have some optical devices as part of, the, as part of a micro or nanoscale system. And those might be to visualize nanoscale systems or to fabricate nanoscale systems like nanolithography. And so it's important to have a little bit of understanding about some uh, optics equations and how those equations scale with size. So for example, uh, this is a scanning electron microscope image of a nanoscale diffraction grating. Okay. And so these might be used in uh, certain microscopes or in nanolithography. Okay, so let's talk about diffraction since we're talking about diffraction gratings. The equations for the diffraction of light are going to change depending upon the geometry of the opening. So here's two common examples. So the light comes in and then it's bent or diffracted at some angle theta. And you can find the sine of that angle theta for a diffraction grating as the sine of theta is equal to n lambda over d. Now in this case, lambda is the wavelength of the light, n is the order of diffraction, and little d here is the spacing in between um, adjacent uh, stripes in your grating, okay? You can also diffract through a pinhole. So if you pass light through a little tiny pinhole, it'll bend out, okay? The angle that it's bent to, or the angle of diffraction here, can be found by the sine of theta equation. Yet again, it's going to be equal to the wavelength of light divided by a geometrical parameter, here big D, where big D is the um, diameter of the opening. So for small angles, small angle diffraction, we can say that sine theta is proportional to theta. That's just our small angle approximation. And so you can see that both scaling laws are kind of similar. They scale as 1 over the characteristic dimension. So your angle of diffraction is going to scale as 1 over your characteristic dimension. Okay, let's talk about limits of resolution for circular apertures and lenses, okay? So let's say that you have a circular aperture and it has a diameter d, okay? What you're going to get is, of course, you're going to get a pattern of light um, that is a nice bright circle in the middle, and then it's going to have rings around it. Okay, this is characteristically what it looks like. So that if you did a line plot through the center of that dot and the surrounding rings, you would get this pattern here. Okay, so this is the intensity of the light that you would see. So the central maximum there has an angular width to it, and that angular width theta can be written as 1.22 lambda over d, where lambda is yet again the wavelength of the light. Now, how can you uh, resolve things with optics? Well, the Rayleigh criterion says that two images are just resolvable when the center of one peak is over the minimum of the first. In other words, they can't completely overlap or you can't tell them apart, right? So for microscopes, um, if we assume that the object is at that focal point, then you can write the resolving power in this way. The resolving power will be the focal length times that equation for theta from the Rayleigh criterion that we've gotten, okay? So it will be f times 1.22 lambda over d. 
Now, typically, the focal length of a microscope lens is half its diameter. So we could write f as d over 2, okay? And then that would reduce this equation for the resolving power to be 1.22 lambda over 2. Now, if you say that 1.22 is just about 1, then that means that the resolving power of a microscope scales as lambda over 2. So the resolving power scales as half the wavelength. And that also means that the features that you can write with a technique like nanolithography is going to be wavelength dependent. All right, so let's talk about the focal length. The focal length of a lens is the distance from the lens to the focal point of the image that it forms. The focal length of a lens is given by the lens maker's formula, which is shown here. 1 over the focal length is equal to n minus 1 times 1 over rf minus 1 over rb. Here, n is the refractive index of the material, right? So, for example, common glass lenses might have a refractive in index around 1.5, whereas air uh, or a vacuum has a refractive index close to 1. Now, r sub f and rb are the front and back radius of the lens, right? The, the radius of curvature of that lens. So, if you think about it then, since n is a refractive index that doesn't depend upon the scale, then that means that 1 over f is going to be proportional to 1 over d's, right? <laughs> so that means that the focal length is proportional to the characteristic dimension of the material, which would be the radius, in this case, of the lenses. All right, let's talk finally about a little bit of biology and scaling. Now, uh, this might be a little morbid to think about, but apparently hearts, your heart has a warranty and it expires after about a billion beats. Um, most animals, if you look it up, live about one billion heartbeats. But your heart rate scales with your mass. So your heart rate, which is shown here as HR, is proportional to your mass to the negative one-fourth power. Now since your mass is proportional to your volume, which is the characteristic dimension d cubed, then we can say that the heart rate is proportional to the characteristic dimension d to the negative three-fourths power. So what that means, of course, is that if an animal is smaller than another type, then its heart's going to beat faster. And that means that smaller animals are going to live shorter lives, right? So if we write the lifespan then um, as proportional to m to the one-fourth, because of course, if you have a certain amount of heartbeats that you live to, right, then your heart rate is uh, going to be proportional to one over your lifespan, okay? So the lifespan is the mass to the one-fourth power, which would then be proportional to d to the three-fourths power. Now, of course, this is just a general statement, okay? Um, there's plenty of animals that have super long lifespans that are about the same size as other animals that have a shorter lifespan. But this is just a general trend we're discussing here, okay? Okay, the metabolic rate of animals also scales with their mass, okay? So the surface area to volume ratio, that really dictates how fast an animal loses its heat to its surroundings. To remember this, you can look back at our previous lecture on the scaling loss for heat. But in general, we can say that smaller animals lose their heat more quickly. And so what that means is that they have to take in more energy or eat more per unit mass. In other words, smaller animals are less efficient than bigger animals, in part because they lose heat to their surroundings so fast. So in order to maintain their body heat, they have to eat more, they have to take in more energy because they're less efficient because they lose more energy to their surroundings. So that means that the metabolic rate is proportional to the mass to the three-fourths power, which means that, because mass is proportional to the characteristic dimension cubed, that is proportional to the characteristic dimension d to the 9 fourths power. So if you'd like more information about any of this, a more in-depth um, explanation, I'll refer you to these links. Um, otherwise, thanks for your attention, and I'll see you around.